So I'm building a new commander deck. Okay. It's a five color commander deck, Lord of the Rings. It's Aragorn the Uniter. Now, yeah. Sam. Now, Sam, you might be looking at me thinking, Connor, Aragorn the Uniter is only red, green, white, and blue. It's not a five. It's not a five color commander. To which I'll say, well, in Magic: The Gathering, Lord of the Rings, black. Or Lord of the Rings, uh, Aragorn's black. Yeah. So it's five colors. All right. Don't know if. Uh... I don't know if that will get you, uh, the, that counts towards his color identity, but... Uh, I mean, probably not. <laughs> probably not, but I, it, it's a good bit. It's a bit. Here's my five... Co- every time I play it, it's going to be like, this is my five-color Lord of the Rings deck with Aragorn the Uniter, and I'm just going to wait for someone to be like, he's not all five colors, though. I'm like, well... Okay, well, anyway. It's fun to joke about because people get really upset that he's black. <laughs> And it's like, eh, does it really should, matter? Should have thought about this joke more like six months ago when the set released. I mean, why Why would I? I'm building the deck now. I mean, you've been wanting to build that deck for a hot minute, though. Yeah, that is true. It's just been lower on the priority because, uh, well, there's so many other decks that I was more excited for. Mm-hmm. One of them, of course, being Lathral Blade of the Elves, but we'll get to that in a we'll moment. We'll get to that in just a second. We'll get to that in one moment. Uh, but for those that are uninitiated, hello, and welcome to this, our Lord and Savior's 58th episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, a D&D and MTG podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. That, I think, is the best that we've done that in a while. It was almost rehearsed. Uh, it, it's almost like we do it every other week for this fucking thing, and we still can't get it right half the it's, time. It, we've only been doing it for a couple weeks now. We we made the modification for it. Yeah. End of December. Newly newly renamed podcast. Yes. Um of course, this episode we're gonna be talking about uh yet again some more fucking AI art bullshit that everyone is getting up in arms about, and I'm just I'm exhausted. I'm just exhausted with it, honestly. Uh of course we're gonna be getting into some Ravnica remastered as that just came out. We got some previews and uh little little set spoilers for murders at Karloff Manor. And uh, a little bit more about uh, about the secret layers. A little bit more secret layers being well, changing. Yeah, secret layers be changing. But uh, we'll get all to all of that in a moment. Of course, we want to thank this episode's sponsor. Of course, Proxy Forge. Thank you to Tyler over at the Proxy Forge. He makes wonderful uh, custom Magic the Gathering proxies. You can get things like dual lands. OG Duel Lands in several different art varieties. He just came out with some anime art versions for the original duels, as well as, I believe, some uh, fetch lands in anime art, that kind of stuff. Does some uh, Commander Precon upgrade packs. Does some Commander Starter packs for very expensive commanders, such as Edgar Markov, who's currently $120. Yeah. For, like... 17, you can get a proxy of him, along with nine other cards that fit well into the archetype that the deck is trying to do. Uh, if you buy through the TikTok shop uh, and use the, the in the notes section, you put Dungeon Bros, you'll also receive a free additional uh, artist collaboration soul ring with another artist named Matt Map that Tyler's been working with. Big thanks to Tyler over the proxy forging. If you watch this podcast live on TikTok when we record it, got some stuff in the TikTok shop. Down there, also didn't really sponsor the podcast, but we have our jank mats out, and that dude's also really cool. Yeah. Just want to shout him out. But of course, the big sponsor of the day, very real sponsor. This is very a, real sponsor. Very, this is a serious sponsorship. No, from the dripping sarcasm. From Hasbro, him, from Hasbro himself. <laughs> Hasbro himself. From Lord, Sir Hasbro. From S- Sir, SYR. From <laughs> President and CEO Christopher Penis himself of Guild Pack Hasbro. Guild Pact Hasbro. Uh, the new <laughs> D&D's newest book, Imagination. For nine easy payments of $9.95, you can play your own campaigns with new Theater of the Mind system developed by Hasbro's own president and CEO, Christopher Penis. In this supplement, you can use your collective brain powers to visualize your campaigns in expert detail, all for a very low price. I want to thank Christopher Penis himself for coming out and sponsoring the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. Thank you very much. Now, Samuel. Yes, that's me. <sighs> that was that was a long, rambling bit of nonsense. We could keep rambling on about this nonsense. I mean, we could. We could. We could tell you the the wonders of imagination, and using theater of the mind. 
or or we can move on with the podcast <laughs> or or um let's move let's skip i got something there let's skip what have uh what have you been playing we'd like to talk about what we've been playing yeah every other week uh recently when it comes to video games i picked up horizon forbidden west mm. um i really loved horizon zero dawn when i played that many years ago when i first got my ps4 which was several years after the ps4 released but that's not important uh horizon forbidden west lovely game lovely graphics i've heard i've heard that uh a lot of people have not been given given proper flowers to the horizon series it seems they like their really? releases well the releases have always coincided with like other major that's true game releases and it's just kind of like sucked a little like one of them came on top came up came out on top of like elden ring <laughs> yeah you know like you can't but horizon great series if you haven't played it you should um, robot dinosaurs robot dinosaurs some of which you can ride um that's pretty cool also i've been getting back into risk of rain with our friends mm-hmm. salem and andy and that is a roguelike that i've really really enjoyed it's a ridiculous uh percentage you know total uh total rng game mm-hmm. every run's different it's great mtg D and D. I haven't done too much in the past couple of course we play every Monday. Every Monday live on the TikTok, Monday Night Magic on the Dungeon Bros TikTok. We can watch us play some two player games for Commander, sometimes open packs. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Uh but no no new builds for me really. Uh kinda going through some of my older decks. Not you know, older as in several months I haven't touched them too much. Uh mm-hmm. and trying to figure out what I need to add because I played Ashnod last night, which is supposed to be my artifact aristocrats deck. Unfortunately, uh, do I, I added some of those stipulations to the deck building process, and in those stipulations, I lost a lot of utility pieces. Yeah. So I now need, now need to go back through and uh, re-add those utilities. Mm-hmm. Find find some more specific cards. That makes sense. That makes sense. I've been I've been also pondering the options as well. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, ha- at long last, finished my Golgari Elves deck, Lathro Blade of the Elves. She's been sitting in a state of slow build for many months at this point, and she's at a point where she is playable now. Uh, and based on Monday Night Magic, not too shabby. Not too shabby either. Probably a few too many lands, seeing as it's elves, and uh, there's several elves in there that create many manners. Many, many manas. So that's a whole thing. I'm also beginning the process of building my Aragorn the Uniter deck, as, as we joked about earlier, but... Uh, we're going to be the deck building restriction on Aragorn is I am required to commit one member of the fellowship, at least each member of the fellowship in uh, in at least one card. So you've got to have Frodo, Sam, Mary, Pippin, um, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Gandalf, and Boromir. Uh, Faramir has ended up in there as well, and I'm just I'm mostly sticking to Lord of the Rings characters. Uh, there's some there's some ex- exceptions, obviously. I have Narset in Light and Exile. I had a second copy of her from when we opened up Aftermath stuff for really, really cheap. We bought that box for like 80 bucks. Yeah. Um, so Narset is in there. Uh, Ginny Fey is in there. Aragorn makes tokens when you cast white spells, so she just gives better tokens. Uh, also comes in three colors, so she triggers three colors of Aragorn's abilities. Uh, it's a good time. I already have my villains deck with uh, Lord of the Nazgul. Um, and, and I wanted, I wanted to represent the fellowship a little bit. There you go. I'm an addict. I'm also working on an Oathbreaker deck with, uh, Quintorius Cond from Lost Caverns of Ixalan, casting spells from Exile, Boros, all that kind of stuff. Don't really know what I'm doing with that yet. I haven't f- picked like a signature spell, so yeah. I'm basically just kind of getting like good, good Exile, like, Im- I think it's, Im- what's it called? Impulse draw? Uh, yeah. Because of Reckless Impulse. Yeah. Um, impulse draw effects and like discover. Yeah, effectively, it's one of those that there's just so many ways to build it. I feel like you could, you yeah, you kind of gotta focus on which which path you might want to do do or add a theme to it to yeah. make it really cohesive. Yeah, I imagine that reckless impulse or like Ren's resolve is gonna end up as the signature spell, just because that's could do Jessica's will. Could do Jessica's will. I don't have a Jessica's will. I would need. Oh, uh, we one. got a proxy of it. Do we have a proxy of Jessica? Ooh, I might need to look into that later. Um, is it in a deck? I don't think so. I, it might. It, we need. We we got a lot of those proxy forge proxies. And, we do. Uh, we need to find. We need to Pilot. start through and see where we are at. Yeah, they they uh they hooked us up over at the proxy forge with a lot of great stuff, and and we wanna we wanna give them the proper sharing. We've also, I believe, both individually 
bought more packs of Proxy Forge stuff because it's that good. <laughs> and we like it that much. Also, some of the cards, also some real MTG cards are way too expensive. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you wanted a, a full cycle of the OG Dual Lands, that's like $10,000. I just, I just wanted to know hair talk, and that's like 26 <laughs> bucks on a good day. That's true. That is true. Um, in the in the realm of video games, I'm obviously awaiting the imminent release of Persona 3 Reload. Yes. That's going to be coming out in February. I already have my pre-order for that. In a uh, big Persona fan here. Uh, been, I've, I've been wanting to get back into and doing a new game plus run on Final Fantasy 16. I just haven't really had a lot of time at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, where I haven't been just utterly exhausted and basically falling asleep on the couch. So I just play Minecraft at work. (laughs) There you go. So uh, a quick question before we get into what the upcoming releases are, Sam. We, we, this is of course an MTG, uh, ostensibly Mm -hmm. a Dungeons and Dragons and MTG podcast. Yes. And we talk about a lot of bullshit. We haven't had a lot to talk about in D&D realm recently. We have not. Ever since the last one D&D playtest, there really hasn't been any big movers or shakers. There's been the Book of Many Things finally coming out, but even that was released digitally. People have been just waiting on the physical product that mm-hmm. had the the uh, the new deck. The tarot card. Um, is that, we've been saying that they've been releasing too many D&D products, and... It seems like the only things left on the schedule are Vecna, Eve of Ruin, and quests from the Infinite Staircase, and then 1D&D, or D&D 5th Edition, the next one. Yes. The, re, the re-editioning. <laughs> are, are, we, are we concerned by the lack of communication or the lack of product release, or is it kind of refreshing? I mean, so I think the lack of product release itself is not a bad thing. Again, that's what we've been asking for. We've been saying for literally years on this podcast now, because we're over two years old on this podcast. It's wild, it's by wild. the way. Uh, we're t- we, we are tired. We don't want all these books. A lot of these books aren't good enough even to, you know, to pay the price for. Mm-hmm. What I think is the concerning part is the lack of things that, that Watsi is saying about upcomings and new things coming. Like, we don't just... You know, I mean, obviously they they have plans several years in advance for what they're doing. Oh yeah. Um. You know, the they've been working on the one D and D for over two years now, just in the public eye. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, why aren't we hearing about more of the things that they're planning to put out once one D? We don't even well, we don't even technically have the one D and D release date yet they said they said 2024 they said they they're look i think and then they went back and said okay now we're looking at the end of q1 beginning of q2 of 2024 so we're getting closer to an actual date but what we're not getting is okay once this comes out then we're gonna have some other fun you know what are they gonna just drop seven adventures on us all at once are they gonna drop you know we have um the quest from the infinite staircase is the uh anthology book coming out this year are they going to try to do another one as soon as that releases? Who knows? I. What's going to be the starter adventure? Yeah, that's the big. That's the big one. We don't know how. We don't. We're we're into twenty twenty four, and they're supposedly going to be releasing this this update to Dungeons and Dragons between like end of Q one would be March, mm-hmm. beginning of Q two would be April. We're in the middle of January, the back end of January, and we have no clue when they're going to be coming out. We have no clue what the the releases are like after mm-hmm. they come out. All we have is Vecna Eve of Ruin, which is 2024, which is a 5th edition, current 5th edition, and then Quest for the Infinite Staircase, which is also current 5th edition, and we don't have the release dates for either of those either. Nope. I would suspect February, March, but we don't know. Nope. Uh, I am a little bit concerned for the for the quiet. I feel like they're trying to delay the inevitable of one D and D is being delayed. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't see how they thought that everything was going to go smoothly after firing a whole lot of people. Yeah. Um, it is a little bit concerning, but it is also nice that they've kind of just shut up and they're doing their work for once we can hope anyway we can we can hope or they're going to come back and say one dnd is canceled and the last dungeons and dragons book to be released is going to be quest from the infinite staircase which would be very sad that would be sad but at the same time again 
and, and again, something we've said for for a long time, you could never buy you could never buy a new Wizard of the Coast product again and still have 67 years of uh, of D- D&D 5th edition to play. Oh, you could play 5th edition for the rest of your life as it exists right now and never repeat the same thing. Yeah. Very easily. And that's not even homebrewing your own world. Yeah. I mean, even the, the, the last year we got what four, four four just four books alone that were were here's here's campaigns and adventures and everything mm-hmm. that we haven't even touched and looked at like read through well because dragon lance spell jammer those are recent they redid um i mean curse of strahd they redid that they redid uh was it ghost of salt marsh good no, uh, no, 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 no. They redid the yeah, the see. starter adventure. Jeez. Yeah. The shipwreck. Yeah, yes. Uh, Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. There we go. There we go. There plus we go. they put out Fandelver the campaign, plus they put out Plane Chase last year, or Planescape last year. Not Plane Chase. That's an MTG. That'd be fun, though. <laughs> That'd be cool if they did Plane Chase. Yeah, plus uh, all the MTG-related uh, realms. Strixhaven, Ravnica. Theros. Theros. Uh, then all of the anthology books. All, oh, yeah. And those are great. Those are fantastic. Then you have Exandria. Then you have Call of the Nether Deep with yeah. Exandria for Critical Role stuff. You have the Dungeon Dudes, Dungeons and Drakenheim, now an official third party D and D Beyond product as mm-hmm. well. I mean, the world's your oyster in D and D, and you with uh, Vecna. Ooh bopped the microphone there a little bit. I don't know if that picked up. But even with Vecna, Eve of Ruin, you're going to have your highest level yeah. opportunity for adventure as well. You're going to have something for everything. So while it is a little bit nervous, a little bit nerve-wracking, we haven't, it's been it's been a little, little quiet. It's probably for the best, yes. all things considered, but something to think about nonetheless. Before we get into the upcoming releases as we talk about them every single week, I do much, just want to do a quick rundown. The Duels of Mandadorks podcast you can find on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, as well as our YouTube channel every other week on Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We also have a TikTok where we do our Monday Night Magic live streams. Every Monday night we play Magic the Gathering. Two-player commander. Sometimes we open up some Jumpstart boosters. Sometimes we open up some new set boosters or i guess now they're going to be play boosters play after boosters. after ravnica remastered after, Rav- after ravnica remastered we also have the instagram the youtube channel twitter discord a whole bunch of stuff link in the bio check out our tiktok shop as well sam it looks like you have something that you want to but right before we get into the upcoming releases uh we like to we have the tiktok live happening We'd like to shout out some things that happen uh there are some questions we'll get to those at the end don't worry but we did just want to shout out uh mystery sniper being in the chat Oh yes, subscriber Wee Woo, but also uh, DM Paula just said drive by, uh, just some drive by love, and uh, sent us a gift. We thank you, Paula. Uh, Paula also says agreed, plenty to play without spending any more money on yeah. Watsy. It's that is that is the biggest thing, and you can even you can even go to your uh, your local half price books, yeah, or uh, a used bookstore. Those are, or Goodwill can like. There's so many places you can buy used D and D books. Mm-hmm. Uh, pre-owned D and D books that they're not making any money from that. No, <laughs> Watsy doesn't get any money when you buy a used book or a book on eBay or a book off Facebook Marketplace. Just something to consider, Sam. All right, give us a rundown of the upcoming D and D Magic releases. The upcoming, uh, we'll start with D and D upcoming releases. The Book of Many Things is out now. Of course, the digital version will released in the end of October, but the uh, physical copies finally released January fourth. Uh, we also have the I Vecna Eve of Ruin, which will be coming this year, and quests from quests from the Infinite Staircase will be coming yes. this year. Uh, do we want to? L- we'll look real quick. So, with the release of the Deck of Many Things, uh, there's some pros and cons to it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, for one, it's a hundred dollars. <laughs> it is a hundred dollars, which is the price point compared to even even other releases. Like they they're they're like, hey, we're on a sixty nine nine nine, starting with Big B. And yes, this does come with extra things, namely the deck. Yeah, uh, the deck is like the selling point. Yeah, is the whole point. And and they built an entire system of like creating. Uh, you you're playing a roguelike, like generated roguelike style dungeons mm-hmm. based on drawing cards from the deck, which is cool and it's a cool system. But a hundred dollars for a book and a deck of cards that has been delayed to oblivion. I will say the delayed has been for good reason. They this is true. They got the they got the first samples back from the printer and they were not happy. Mm-hmm. They were they were low they were lower quality and uh, so that is a feel good that yes it was delayed but at least they were doing it for the right reasons. 
Yeah. Not just the, yeah. So pros and cons. Pros. Great new play options for characters. The mini adventures are well made, if a bit isolated. And procedurally generated encounters are fun. Yeah, I think that was the biggest selling point that they weren't really advertising very well for a while was the procedurally generated aspect of the deck of many or mm-hmm. the, the book of many things book of many things cons of course are they're very hard to fold into an existing campaign without pure chaos the actual deck lacks visual personality and the price is excessive that it when it comes to the watsi products that's basically what it always comes down to when it's magic or or uh we'll get it we'll get into ravnica remastered here shortly uh, or D is that product's good Mm -hmm. it's likely to be pretty dece um but then you look at the price and you're like ah well i'll wait (laughs) right (laughs) i'll wait i'll wait until they're overstock and then quite clearly uh just trying to get rid of inventory (laughs) uh looking at you campaign cases (laughs) if we could pick up any set boost any booster uh boxes at an ollie's for that cheap man we would just Oh, we'd be buy them out. out. We'd be rolling in cards. So many cards. Anyway, moving on to Magic the Gathering. We have Ravnica Remastered, which is out now, released this past weekend. Uh, then we have Murder at Karlov Manor, which will release February 9th, your birthday. Ha-ha. Uh, we have the Fallout decks coming March 8th. The Outlaws of Thunder Junction will be dropping in April with Modern Horizon 3 in June. The Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond will be in July of this year. And then finally in Q3, we have Bloomborough and Duskmorn in Q4. Yes, we'll look at uh, we'll look at Rav. Sorry, not Ravnica. Murders at Karlov Manor, which is set in Ravnica. It is set in Ravnica, and we're getting some of the newest set information updates and a couple of set spoilers. Uh, Local game stores, you're going to have pre-release from February second to eighth. Then on the sixth, you're going to get it on Magic Arenas, and then of course the global release is my birthday, February ninth. Uh, start my birthday started in 1995 and then every year since wow you're going to have the classic array this is the first time we're going to be getting the play booster in the play booster box so they have combined the draft booster and the set booster into one so you have a set booster that gives a little bit less value than what the set booster was and then you have a booster that is possibly a little bit more difficult to draft with but you can do both of them and it's yeah. one product, and instead of having two booster boxes with one that is considered the better and one that is considered the lesser, uh, it's going to simplify it and for both consumers and for local game stores, more importantly. Of course, it's going to have the collector booster box, the bundle, the pre-release kit, and it's going to come with four commander decks. Uh, we have one that is red, green, and white. Naya. Naya. Deadly Disguise, where you're disguising cards and big surprises. We're not quite sure what that means, because they'll preview the... Dra- uh, the bo- uh, the uh, sorry the commander decks next week January twenty fourth, uh, but we we're gonna guess this is maybe morph in Naya maybe a little bit of morph. Uh, big surprises makes me think that it's also just gonna be big cards. It could also be yeah, some sort of egg deck. Yeah, ooh, that is true. That is true. Uh, we also have Revenant Recon. It is a Demir deck. Uh, this one is fairly straightforward. You're going to surveil your cards, which is basically scry, except instead of putting it at the bottom, you put it in your graveyard. And then uh, you're going to resurrect those creatures. <laughs> Pretty classic Demir stuff. Classic Demir stuff. You then got uh, Deep Clue C, which is a green, white, and blue deck, focusing on card advantage and the clue token. So probably going to be a lot of investigating yeah. with that. What is the color combination for that? For uh, green, white, and blue. My mind is actually blank on that right now. So we got, it's not Mardu. It's not, oh gosh, it's not Abzan. Oh wait, do we have the cheat sheet? Oh gosh, Sam is... Sam is rifling through all of his things for the cheat sheet of the color combos. Bant. Bant. It is Bant. That is right. Uh, And then the last deck is Blame Game. That is a Boros deck, which is red and white, where you're goading creatures and identifying suspects. Whatever that means. Who knows? I mean, this. so obviously this uh, set is releasing um, with the theme of, and with the theme of mystery, and they're also releasing Clue. The, the, the classic Hasbro game Clue with Magic the Gather with Car- Murder at Karlov Manor theme. <sighs> yeah. And then yeah. Clue, of course, you know, you, you, uh, you, the idea is to uh, deduce who murdered somebody, who murdered Mr. Body. Uh, and so we can assume maybe that has something to relate to it. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, you're going to see the keyword ability investigate a lot. Investigate is simply create a clue token, which is an artifact with uh, you pay to sacrifice it to draw a card. And that is going to be on 
a ton of cards. Which you know For, what that means? That Academy Manufacturer's price is going to shoot up again. Yet again. It seems like every set that creates tokens. <laughs> food, to- food tokens with a couple with a Lord of the Rings and Wilds of Eldraine and now clue tokens. Did it, does map do map tokens work with it? No, it's only clue, food, or treasure. Mm. When you create one of those, need, you, you create the all three yeah. instead. Um, we got a couple of the original release of the preview cards. Uh, I don't. There's not really a ton that I want to point out. I like deduce. Uh, they have like this little spyglass alternate art that looks really cool. Uh, deduce is a one and a blue. It's an instant draw card. Events investigate. I really like this one up in the right-hand corner, uh, the uh, Benthic Criminologists. Uh, first, Criminologists is just fun to say. <laughs> but secondly, it's a Merfolk Wizard for four and blue for a four five. Whenever it enters a battlefield or attacks, you may sacrifice an artifact if you do draw a card. Obviously, that just means you get to use your clue tokens for free. Yes. Or if you have some food or a treasure on there. Academy turn those, turn those into <laughs> turn those into cards advantage as well. Yes, yes. Uh, we got uh, an interesting rare here. Wojek Investigator, two in a white for a two four flying vigilance angel detective. We've got the detective creature type now. That's pretty. pretty pretty neat at the beginning of your upkeep investigate once for each opponent who has more cards in hand than you. As every turn, you're going to be creating clue tokens out the ass. And if you have a chem- academy manufacturer on the field, then you're also going to be creating food and treasure. That's true. That's true. Uh, I also big fan of the lead pipe. <laughs> Artifact clue equipment. Yeah. So you're going to be get clues that are equipments, which seemingly are going to simply have pay two sack, draw a card for the artif- for the equipment itself. It also gives plus two, plus oh, and whenever a equipped creature dies, each opponent loses a life. I like this trend that they've been doing where they have where they're including uh, they did it with a bunch of the foods and now clues where they're permanents in, or instead of just tokens. They're cards instead of just tokens, but they also have the effect of just mm-hmm. either sack to gain life or sack to draw a card. Uh, and those work really well in the aristocrat artifact. The Your astronaut uh, deck. My astronaut deck. <laughs> but like uh, Lord of the Rings had Lembus. Yeah. Which is just a card that functioned like a food token and then had other benefits. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in Wilds of Eldraine, the like gingerbread cards. And the candy trail. Yes. Love yes. that card. Those are good cards. What are you what are you looking at here? Um, I don't know if feeling? it's in this set. I think it's actually from the Yeah, well, uh, uh, let's scroll down a little bit. Uh, so we were talking about in before the podcast, uh, the other alternate art that they have. The uh, profile, the the case profile alternate art. For example, example, Alquist, Proft, Master Sleuth, One White Blue, Legendary Human Detective, does something. Don't care. The art on it is kind of a, a weird art. I. It's mostly the frame for me. Like, the art the, itself, like, he like he looks good. Aurelia, The Law Above. Uh, these are just some of the preview cards that we've seen in this art. Um, the art itself is fine. The frame where it looks like it's a picture and then it's like a little bit skew and then it looks like a case file folder. Yeah. Like it's just, it, it, it messes with the border just enough in weird ways that I'm not super fond of it, but you know, to each their own. Uh, I want to shout out demand answers as a red card. It's common. It is a one in a red instant as an additional cost to cast the spell, sacrifice an artifact or discard a card to draw two cards. It's another thrill of possibilities, but you can either you don't have to discard; you could sack the artifact. Yes, uh, and it common. It's gonna it, card draw in red is wonderful. <laughs> love card we, draw. we love card draw in red. We love ways to pitch things to the graveyard. We love ways to sacrifice things. Two mana, instant speed, draw two. All around, all great, all great. Uh, you're also getting some some reprints. Uh, we've seen we've seen shock a million times before. Um, we're getting the one of the bigger he, uh, reprints here, lightning helix, which is red and white instant deal three damage to it any target, and then you gain three life. Um, magnifying glass, three mana artifact that taps for colorless. You can pay four to investigate, which creates a clue token. Um. <laughs> the meddling youths, three red white. Four or five human detectives haste whenever you attack with three or more creatures. Investigate, but more importantly, the flavor text: chaotic but surprisingly fearless. Often seen in the company of a strangely intelligent hound. This is legally distinct Scooby Doo gang. Legally distinct 
Scooby-Doo. We would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for you meddling youths <laughs> and your strangely intelligent hound. Uh, the last little... What you I was going to say, you notice that they only have Fred, Velma, and Daphne in this picture. Uh, we must wonder, are they going to drop a Shaggy and Scooby... Uh, oh, legally distinct Shaggy and Scooby, but a legendary creature? There has to be a... I, I would be shocked if there was not a legally distinct Scooby-Doo in here at some point. Simic has something to do with food. That checks out. That checks out. <laughs> that, that's my guess. Uh, the last one that I want to shout out is an uncommon card. Red and a, red and a blue for a 1-1 flying artifact creature Drake, the gleaming gear Drake. When it enters the battlefield, you investigate whenever you sacrifice an artifact. Put a plus one, plus one counter on that bitch. That's going to fit in a lot of things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my own things included so that's a good time um again murders of karlov manor we'll be we'll be learning more about that in uh, the coming weeks probably in the next podcast we're gonna have a lot more to say about that let's get into the big story we mentioned it earlier some more ai art nonsense courtesy of wizards of the coast we'll say on the on the live um somebody asks other do not want a face reveal so uh the billboard covered up my face. Ha, <laughs> ah, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, my face is fine to reveal, but uh, TikTok doesn't like it, apparently. Amazing. Neither do I. All right. But that's just me. Anyway, um, AI art nonsense from Wizards of the Coast. <sighs> so this one's from a Twitter ad yet again. And I would like to point out, again, we've, we've litigated this already on the podcast. We've litigated this sort of situation on the podcast. And that is... The social media guys, like, come on. Does it really matter when they're making a background and then slapping some digital versions of of the Shocklands in the retro frame? Does it really matter? I think this is a much lower um, priority use of AI art than the card arts themselves or, like, box arts and stuff mm -hmm. for the cards or, like, in the D&D books. The problem here being was the response from Magic the Gathering and Wizards of the Coast. Quote, so they sent out this tweet that showed a picture of the MTG shock lands in the retro frame with, it's positively shocking how good these lands look in retro frame. Hashtag MTG Ravnica. Then everyone was like, the fuck you doing AI art for again? Yeah, we've, we've been... <laughs> What is it? How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? And their response was, we understand confusion by fans given the style being different than card art, but we stand by our previous statement. This art was created by humans and not AI. The Wizards of the Coast thread apologizing. <laughs> okay. After they said that. Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. According to Wizards of the Coast announcement on Daily MTG, the retraction of this ad was, quote, thanks to our diligent community, end quote. The Magic community was vocal in reporting their findings in this and quickly noted the use of generative AI. The article goes on to say, quote, we are rethinking our process of how we work with vendors for our marketing creative. Their apologizing thread is below. Quote, well, we made a mistake earlier when we said that the marketing image we posted was not created using AI. Read on for more. As you, our diligent community, pointed out, it looks like some AI components that are now popping up in industry standard tools like Photoshop crept into our marketing creative, even if a human being did the work to create the overall image. While the art came from a vendor, it's on us to make sure that we are living up to our promise to support the amazing human ingenuity that makes magic great. We already made clear that we require artists, writers, and creatives contributing to the magic TCG to refrain from using AI generative tools to create final magic products. Now we're evaluating how we work with our vendors on creative beyond our products, like these marketing images, to make sure that we are living up to those values. And then they have a full article statement, which is effectively exactly the same on magic.wizards.com. Completely deleted that ad from their Twitter page. And uh, yeah, it also means they deleted their reply where they were doubling down that it wasn't using AI. Of course, this was uh, this is the second time that we've seen this in promotional material when they last promoted the secret layer cross Tomb Raider promotion on MTG Secret Layers, where they clearly used some AI-generative background with uh, original art 
of the Tomb Raider herself put on top. Sam, we've litigated this before Mm -hmm. on the podcast. I... There is, in my estimation, there's two ways that you can use AI art. Mm -hmm. There is the ethical way and the non-ethical way. A lot of big news has been going around of uh, ChatGPT and other things like MidJourney. There's lawsuits that are going on where uh, I believe it was a leaked list of names of like hundreds and hundreds of online artists where they were specifically naming and listing them as artists that they've taken work from to train their AI tools. Mm -hmm. That is not ethical. Photoshop, Adobe... Their AI that they're building into their the AI that they're building into their software is different. They're licensing art to then train their AI on. As part of the license to use Photoshop, the stuff that you make in Photoshop can be used to train their AI. And that is part of their licensing agreement, and you agree to that when you use the software. Mm. Whether or not that's a little bit sly, a little sneaky, you can choose not to use Photoshop. You can use free open source alternatives like GIMP. There's also things like Canva and other uh, online browser-based options that are very, very powerful. It's not Photoshop. But in this instance, if they're working with a vendor that's creating marketing materials for them and a person is using the built-in AI in Photoshop to generate it, I don't think that that I would I would be willing to guess with I would say 80% certainty that that would not be um stolen artwork. Mm. That I believe it's licensed artwork if you're using Photoshop for that. Um as for these other AI image generators, that's it's the wild west out there. Yeah. And honestly, I'm really fucking tired of all <laughs> all of this AI art shit. It's one of those things where it is, one, still so very new. I mean, it's only, you know, I think we mentioned last time, even a year ago, people were over the moon that they could pay $25 to get um, AI art portraits of themselves as astronauts or or cowboys. Uh, At this time, though, the community has said, we don't want AI art. Yeah. Uh, Also, wizards, you know, pay pay your artists. Um, that comes down in my mind to more just listening to your customers really does and and, and doing what your audience like doing what the market is demanding of you more than an ethical question Hasbro has just not been good about listening to their customers I mean that's why we had the entire OGL controversy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what I think is is what I think is amusing I don't know if amusing is the right word be musing is their reply Oh my God! That is, is there. We were wrong. Yes, I get you wrong. Um, but the way you, the way they did it. First off, we saw this again when they did the OGL, where they're like, the community really came together, and we agree, and this is all the better, better for everyone. It's like, no, you fucked up, and now you're trying to you're backtracking. Backtracking. But there's a there's a podcast I listen to, or used to a lot more. It's a story podcast called Welcome to Night Vale. And one of the things that you know, there the the whole setting is, it's a a, a small desert community radio station and it's it's this weird fantasy sort of thing but one one as thing they'll commonly do is uh, apologies or like uh, they'll do this thing where we were wrong here are the following corrections and of course it's usually like we were wrong alligators can eat you mm-hmm. and that's kind of what this feels like is yeah. we were wrong ai can create art and we did use it it's like <laughs> Pay attention, guys. Like, y- yes, re- it, maybe you should have been reviewing your your contract with mm-hmm. with third parties sooner. When we've yelled at you, the we as in the community have yelled at you several times at this point. Yeah. Now, again, I want to look at it from the perspective. I I don't like defending a corporation, no. but if we're going if we're going to be attacking these corporations and holding their feet to the fire as we should, we need to know when to and when not to. For certain things. In this instance, they hired a vendor 
that vendor had an artist that was using Photoshop, and then inside that Photoshop tool, there's AI generati generative tools that are trained off of ethical systems where they've licensed artwork. I don't see any problem with them with that happening. If the community is not happy with them using AI art, then that is the market speaking, and they can react to that market mm -hmm. and choose not to engage with it that way. My problem comes with the doubling down that no, no, that we didn't use AI generated art. An artist did this. Yeah. And then they went back and were like, oopsie, oopsie poopsie. We made a little fucky wucky. Sorry. Yeah. That it's, if they don't know for sure, like clearly they were, clearly their response of no, an artist made this was, did this use AI art? Well, no, we had this person work on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. And not, well, what tools did that person use? How did they make it? Because when you look at that image, there's part there's aspects of it. There's some parts that people pointed out where it's like, actually, that you could argue that that's like the refraction of glass and stuff. And then you're like, oh, there's a cable that just goes to nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, that one's hard to <laughs> that one that one's hard to deny. You know, um, I'm really tired of Twitter outrage about AI art, uh, particularly when it comes to marketing materials. When you have AI and stolen art in cards and in uh, packaging and that kind of stuff, I'm going to be a bit more concerned. Specifically with stolen stuff. Yes. Specifically absolutely. with stolen work. Uh, well, like when we talked about with the Lost Caverns of Ixalan, Commander Precons that had... Uh, the Wayfarer's Bobble that the, had. That had the stolen art in it. Which, by the way, I want to pick up some copies of that Wayfarer's Bobble because that's a fun story. They're as expensive as any other Wayfarer's Bobble, so, you know. They're very cheap. Um, that is that is all I have to say about this unless Let's you want to litigate it further. Move on. All right, let's get to let's get to the fun things to talk about. We've got Ravnica remastered, Buyer's Guy list. Um, ah, before we get to that, we, normally we do the wrap up at the end. I'd rather just get it out of the way so we can just ramble on about Ravnica. Uh, Secret layer printing philosophy is changing. Uh, so secret layers have been printed uh, to demand mm -hmm. in uh, recent years. So you could basically there's no limit, and people can just order a ton and then they produce it and then they ship it and that's led to really large shipping times for a lot of these secret layer releases and their solution to limit the the production and distribution pipeline for secret layers is they're going to do limited run printings uh, so instead they're going to decide we're going to make this many copies of this secret layer we're going to print that many copies and then we're going to sell that many copies and that way they have them ready and can just immediately ship once the uh, sales have been made yeah so shipping times for secret layers are going to go down. The big criticism that some people have been levying is, oh, they're just trying to create a fear of missing out with their secret layer products. See, I think that is a, again, I don't like to defend anyone in, in the corporate world, but you kind of got to have one or the other, right? Yeah. Also, I've gotten a couple of secret layers and the quality, it, this, the, when you print, you know, like uh, the we were seeing a lot from Phyrexia all will be one basically until the end of the year where they got rid of the printing problem with pringling on foils. Mm -hmm. um, however, the secret layer I got, both of them looked like a, a damn crisp. So we've, we've kind of been noticing that. When it comes to the core set releases, yeah. the, the foils have been great. Yeah. Very well, very well printed. The Lord of the Rings foils were phenomenal, mm -hmm. I thought. Even the... Um, even like the collector booster, like the surge foils and stuff are yeah. beautiful. They look great. Uh, when you get to the quote unquote premium singleton products, yeah, is where you get the problems because the commanders still Pringle for yeah. the commander precons. Those are singleton products. the The scene boxes for Lord of the Rings, singleton products, specific cards. Then the secret layers, singleton products, yeah. specific cards. All of them have a bad pringling process. So it seems like they have two kind of production pipelines of those that are being made and cut and put into packs. And that pipeline is good with their foiling. And then the foiling process for we have these very specific cards that are these going in very specific. Yes. And those are more susceptible to the pringling. Like all of my my Lord of the Rings scene box cards, which by the way, I got all the scene boxes. They're beautiful. Um, the cards, whatever. But the the art on them is beautiful, and those all Pringle. Oh yeah, quite a bit. And so, you know, obviously, hopefully now since they're changing the pipeline, they're putting it down the other one. That's that's we make them. 
They're, we make them quality. Now we're going to cut them. We're going to sell what we have. And so that, so higher quality and better shipping times. Like, I don't think anybody's going to complain about that. However, yeah, the fact that there's only going to be a limited amount sucks. But at the same time, maybe that means we can just, it, it won't mean this, but um, maybe that means we can get fewer of them and just have more of, of the ones that they decide to print. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really all I have to say about that. It seems like a lot of people are upset about <laughs> about the oh they're just trying to they're just trying to create more more demand by limiting the they're just trying to increase the price by limiting the the output. It's like well if they don't increase the price that's definitely one thing. Yeah, if they keep the price the same, uh, then order it before it sells out. <laughs> Or just don't order secret layers. Or just don't order Honestly, secret layers. Honestly, I've ordered three now, and I think I'm good. I've ordered zero, and that include and they made a really cool like '80s movie Lord of the Rings art for Lord of the Rings cards, and they picked bad cards, so I didn't buy it. Yeah, that's also a problem with it is that the fact the the co- the price of the cards that they're reprinting are wildly quality. wildly inconsistent. Wild and. Yeah, sure. You do. You know, once you have these secret layers, you can pick up those singles usually online. You can because people buy them and sell them, and they're being sold for a higher price. Like I got a Colossus Hammer from uh, the uh, Evil Dead secret mm-hmm. layer. Regular Colossus Hammer, a couple bucks. Yeah. That one, twenty bucks. It's it's still just a Colossus Hammer when you come down to it. And if you really want that, if you want the if you want the card for the card. And obviously, you can just buy the regular one. If you want it for the special thing, well, then you're probably talking to a different type of, of budget. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's all I have to say about Secret Lairs. Uh, let's move on. Last story of the day. We're going to be talking about the Ravnica remastered set that came out on Friday at your local game stores. Uh, Friday. Gosh, I can never remember. I'm terrible with dates. I am terrible with dates. Friday the 12th. Uh, we're recording this on the 16th. This goes live on the 17th. So it is out now. We're going to be opening our own box. Uh, this coming Monday for Monday Night Magic, mm-hmm. as we'll be getting that box soon. But the big thing, Ravnica Remastered, it's going to be, it is draft boosters inside the packs. You get nine commons, three uncommons. You get a retro frame, common or uncommon, a rare or mythic that can also be a retro frame. And then you have a mana fixing slot that can include the guild gates, which are tapped dual lands. You have the signets, which are mana rocks. You have the shock lands and the uh, artifact chromatic lantern. So instead of a basic land slot, you're getting the mana fixing slot, which is going to make drafts a lot more... They, they kind of had to do that because Ravnica is obsessed with the guilds. The whole idea is that you're is a, of these two-color combos that you're going to want to choose and play during mm-hmm. the draft. Yes. Uh, we're going to get into some cards here in a moment. Uh, first thing, though, is it worth it to buy? Is it Boilerworks? Is it worth it to buy the Ravnica Remastered box? And a lot of people are saying no. no. And that is not because of the design of the set. People have been very happy with the design of the set, the draft environment of the set. It really comes down to the monetary value of the cards and then the price that is being sold for right now as a box and packs. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we look at the other remastered sets, you got Time Spiral Remastered, which was more of a limited release. It was the first time they were doing one of these remastered sets. And because of that, uh, the price has actually increased on those boxes. And that is going to be the outlier. Uh, when they last year released Dominaria Remastered, it is going to be sim- more similar to what Ravnica Remastered is doing. So the set, or the draft and the collector booster boxes, uh, the draft booster boxes released at about 170 180 which is similar to what ravnica remastered is right now you can get them for like a hundred dollars mm-hmm. for a box and i suspect that next year if it'll be for ravnica remastered a hundred dollars if not less than that um when we went to scg con i snagged with prize tickets uh just because it was kind of efficient and i didn't really want to pick some things in particular so i just let the lady that was doing it kind of pick out i was like i want it i want this dominary remastered collector booster and then whatever else you want she Mm -hmm. got me a regular dom remastered and like some other crap um those packs are shockingly affordable yeah. right now and you can get a collector booster box of dominary remastered for less than a draft booster box of ravnica remastered (laughs) 
And when you look at some of the cards that were in Dominaria Remastered, what were some of the big hits that we had? For Force example, of will. <laughs> the Force of Will on yeah. the wall that Sam got. Um, Birds of Paradise was in that. A lot, very easy to find. I think I got like three of them. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of really good cards in Dominaria Remastered, and there's a lot of really good cards in Ravnica Remastered. We bought Dominary Remastered when it came out, probably for, I think it was like $160, $170. Something like that. And we're getting Ravnica Remastered for like $180. Arguably, there's less value in these Ravnica boxes. Would you... So we're doing it because we're kind of content creators, and it's going to give us a live stream, and we like the cards, and we're addicts. Yes. Would would you necessarily recommend it? I don't know. So... The part of so yeah, like you're saying, we we want to do it for content, but also like I we wanted to play the the limited environment. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, we play a lot of commander, so getting to do this, you know, do a smaller card format, a multi card format. These are great opportunities, but yeah, at this price, you know, how much you got to wonder how much it is when you go to the uh, the game store and they have their draft night and how much you're going to pay for there. Um, is it worth it to buy if you're just opening the packs for the chase cards? I do not think so at all. I would argue, I would argue that's the same. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Now, if you're doing a draft environment at like a local game store, 15 to $20, I think that's very fair. Mm-hmm. Packs are about $5. $15 would be selling you the packs at cost if you wanted to do a draft yourself, which I think is fine. Um if, if you and all your friends each bought three packs for $15 and then you did a draft night of Ravnica Remastered and you walked away with some cards, I think that's a great deal. I think that's very reasonable price. If you're doing a local game store, you buy in for 20 there's going to be some prize packs, uh, that kind of stuff. Also totally fair. Mm-hmm. The problem is is the buying of the box yeah. for the collection and for just getting value out of it. Because we're let, let's look at some cards here. Let's look at some of the cards. You got the Chromatic Lantern, which is, I think, a pretty good commander card already. Right. So, a, a card that has plenty of reprints. Oh, yeah. It's been reprinted a bunch. You can get it for like three to five bucks now. Uh, the big the big thing in that mana fixing slot is, of course, the Shocklands. And the Shocklands are going to be the big chase of this set. There's the basic art. There's going to be retro frame art. And then there's the extended arts as well. When you look at all of the various arts... When you look at all of all of the cards, those are ten to twenty dollar cards. Yeah, and that's kind of other than Cyclonic Rift, which is also being reprinted, and some very specific alternate arts, which you don't really want to count on those. You're just looking at the cards designed themselves. You've got Cyclonic Rift for like thirty, forty bucks, mm-hmm. and then the next tier is there's a big gap, and then you've got the Shocklands of ten to fifteen, maybe twenty. Yeah. And those are your chase cards. Force of Will, for example, with Dominaria Remastered, that chase card was like... I think it was 70 at the time I cracked it. It's down to about 56. Still. <laughs> that single card is worth more than anything else that yeah. had been printed in, in Ravnica Remastered. And there were plenty of other cards from Dominaria Remastered that had very high value, and, and as well as Time Spiral. There's a lot of cards that are very popular in Time Spiral. Um, if you... The uh, we're using a TCG Player Infinite article, Ravnica Remastered Buyer's Guide, and they have some wonderful charts there showing the breakdowns of the prices of some of these cards uh, over the last gosh couple years, I believe. Um, the Shocklands are really good lands. Mm-hmm. Everyone's gonna want them for their decks. Sure. If you just want Shocklands, <laughs> wait a week or two. Because the prices are going to go way down once everybody has these packs in their hands and opens them. It's also one of those things where those the ones in the mana fixing slots, yeah. The obviously the guild gates are pretty mid. Yeah. Um, you got chromatic lanterns, fine, but those shocks, like while they're good, I mean most they're not irreplaceable. You know. Yeah. There's a lot of cards that, especially if you're playing at higher power, are irreplaceable. But most people aren't playing at that power level and could. Well, you, you know, maybe you replace it with a, a tap land or a check land. Mm-hmm. I love a check land. Love a check land. Uh, love a love a like one a reveal land. Love a re- reveal lands. Reveal land, I think, is like the best of the cheap dual land option or the mm-hmm. two mana land options by far. Um, 
you just show that you have another land in your hand, and then it comes in untapped, and oftentimes you can get that on a turn one. Mm-hmm. Uh, later in the game, it'll probably be a tapped land, just because you don't have as many lands in your hand, probably, but it often comes in untapped. And then, of course, the um, two or more basics. Yeah. Uh, two or more land. Uh, two or more land ones are a bit better than the two or one ba- two or more basics. Uh, and then the battle bond lands, which just need to be reprinted a lot more. <laughs> so the shock lands are obviously the chase cards, but then you've got some other ones. We talked already about Cyclonic Rift. So that's a thirty dollar card. Cyclonic We've, Rift will always be a thirty dollar card. Yes. Uh, you also have Bruvac the Grand Eloquent, which before this printing was similarly priced to Cyclonic Rift, is now already, I believe, under ten dollars again. Uh, Bruvac is just. Uh, a jumpstart card that was then reprinted on the list, so not really reprinted. And it's just uh, you double the mill when you mill people. It's kind of the it's kind of the the, the, the premier blue, mono blue, mono blue mill commander. Yeah. Uh, some other really great ones. Uh, first ever reprint of Cloudstone Curio. Whenever a non-artifact permanent comes into play under your control, you can return another permanent you control that shares permanent type with it to its owner's hand. This is a not very. This is a, a card that goes infinite with a lot. It's a whole lot. It's the first time it's ever been reprinted, and it's probably going to end up under ten dollars as well for the first time, like ever. Uh, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, Planeswalkers taking a back seat in a lot of these sets nowadays. Uh, one of the classic. One of the one of the classic black planeswalkers. You're creating zombies, making people sacrifice creatures. You, whenever a creature of yours dies, you draw a card. Um, the ultimate is devastating as they choose one permanent that they control each each opponent, not you, each opponent, and they sacrifice everything else that includes the lance. Yep. So that is a game ending move if you pull that off. Uh, you got the dark confidant as well, human wizard. At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library, put that into your hand. You lose life equal to its converted mana cost. Basically, draw two on your upkeep. And then Karlov of the Ghost Council, a very valuable card, has not been reprinted much either until now. Uh, Whenever you gain life, you put two counters on it, and then you can pay a white and a black to remove six plus one plus one counters and exile a target creature. With the amount of white uh, plus one plus one counter shenanigans that are available, these cards are great. Um, Prices... Since the release have of Ravnica Remastered, all of them have crashed. <laughs> Most all of them are under ten dollars. Bruvac under ten dollars. Karlov of the Ghost Council under ten dollars. Cloudstone Curio probably going to hit like maybe even five. I mean, it's already it's already the retro frame is seven. The extended new art is ten. The original art's fourteen. Um Dark Confidant, already almost $5. Um, you got other rares. Court of Calling. Crypt. Cryptgast. Hellkite Tyrant. Life from the Loam. Life from the Ro- Loam. Goes real well with the Board Bergmos Enraged. Mm. The reprinting as well. Also goes real well with Slimefoot and Squee. Mm, I hate that. <laughs> I hate everything about that. Uh, these cards also all well under 10 some of them well under five. Hellkite Tyrant, $2. Um, it really comes down to the value, to that card value. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's one of those things where if you're playing the game to play the game, it, yeah, you're probably fine to pick, pick it up, but you're probably going to walk away with some pretty decent cards. If you, if you're looking for it so you can, uh, if this is your gambling addiction, then, better things to buy i would if if you're if you're wanting to feed your pack cracking gambling addiction resell mindset pick up a box of dominaria remastered and this is of course something we got we we're, it's 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 again the 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 people who put this set together to make a great draft experience put a lot of great cards in it for mm-hmm. a great draft experience it's a great set it just sucks that we have to kind of now we have to take this out of we have to take that out of the equation to look at just buying the set because of this mm-hmm. elevated price and of course we don't you know they don't do there's no MSRP never uh, not anymore and and you know 
this you know this harkens back to like Commander Masters, mm-hmm. oh. where, where it's like the price point was so high on Commander Masters, but the chase cards on Commander Masters weren't the chase cards that necessarily people who were wanting to who would want those chase cards would be cracking packs for you know yeah and even even some of the cards that they were wanting to crack your doubling seasons that kind of stuff also had other reprints on the bonus sheet of wilds of el drain were which was not <laughs> premiumly priced it was not and then the not premiumly priced lost caverns of ixalan probably one of the best sets of the year mm-hmm. also had reprints of wonderful cards like mana crypt and cavern of souls and that kind of stuff and so Final final thoughts. Is it worth it to buy Ravnica Remastered? If you are going to play the game, you're going to do some draft, you're going to do some limited, then I think that it is argu- that you can arguably buy this for that reason. Yeah. You find... Gosh, how many packs are in a booster box? How many packs? Probably at least, like, three? At least three. At, at le- least one person can draft. How many are in a fucking box? All right. You get your friends together. You each pitch in 15 to $20, and you do some draft of a box, and then you all walk away with some cards. That's a fine experience. Uh, do as we say, not as we do. Don't if you, buy. If you want to look at the – you know, it'll be interesting when we crack packs on Monday. Uh, we'll go through – and, you know, we'll see how much value we actually get from it. Mm-hmm. The professor of the Tolarian Community College often does the, you know, does the what's in it or crack cracks the box and goes, okay, if, if between the Mythics, Rares, and Foils, I get enough to buy an Xbox, I'll buy an Xbox. Rarely does it happen. Yeah. And if it does, it's usually he gets a second box because he just got over the threshold and then stops. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, you, he gets real lucky. And there's been a couple of times where that video is over an hour. Um, and that's also why he's like broken it up into multiple parts because it's like it is like booster box game, and then it's like an hour and a half. And it's like, oh, he cracks a lot of good shit, <laughs> and then it's like, oh, it's thirty eight minutes. I guess he got one box, <laughs> you know. Um, that is all. That's all we have for the news today. Again, this is the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, which goes live every other week. Uh, we go live on TikTok to record on Tuesdays at about noon Eastern Standard Time and then post the following day on Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m. on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, YouTube channel of the Dungeon Bros. Uh, every other week we talk about magic, D&D, and we like to end these episodes every week as we do with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the community and the TikTok live chat. Samuel. We'll start with a, we'll start with a lovely one uh, here. Samantha Wills asks, what fills your heart's to bursting levels of happiness. Oh. I just thought of like three awful things. <laughs> just say Lord of the Rings and be done with it. The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Specifically my sword that I got at a Renaissance fair. That's fair. And the set that I'm collecting and want to make a set cube out of. Sam. Um... Yeah, the days you get to sleep in. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay. I slept in today. It was great. <laughs> uh, hmm. Bryce Parrish asks, do you find 5e combat raw, rules is written, as quite boring, having to put so much work uh, in to make it decently fun? Yeah. I will say that is one thing I have found over my time being a dungeon master is... I don't like it's fine to do just you know rules as written combat but man do I just look for ways to make my own mechanics and add new things exactly now as a dungeon master I think it's better of an experience because you're having to keep track of a lot more and you're having to to litigate other players turns so you're engaged the whole Mm -hmm. time as a player oh man it gets boring as shit real fast oh yeah um recently uh D&D Shorts made a video that got me thinking a whole lot and I kind of want to bring this up to my work play group and I might institute it in my uh, soon to be call of the nether deep campaign yeah of there's two turns in combat the player's turn and the NPC's turn and that's it and you could even make it the good guys and the bad guys turn though you kind of get into a gray area so I like making it the player's turn and then the NPC's turn mm. And you could have, like, a group initiative role versus uh, the NPCs. 
And if they roll higher, then the players go first. If they roll lower, then the NPCs go first. And so um, what happens with that is all the players are taking their turns at the same time, which means you can have things like the monk runs in, and then the wizard casts a buff spell on them, and then uh, the ranger fires an arrow and misses, and then the bard is like, oh, I'm going to bardic inspiration them, and then they get to fire their second arrow with sharpshooter, and it hits because they use the bardic inspiration. So things are happening more in a reaction sense and are working together and synergizing, so all of the players are engaged with each other, Mm -hmm. and that also makes their combats more valuable and they're more attentive to what is going on um and then you can do things like legendary actions as more reaction instead of at the end of a player's turn Mm -hmm. uh which makes even more sense than the legendary action system uh and then it's very easy to be like all right all these people move and then we're going to roll a whole bunch of dice we're going to do attacks real quick and do damage real quick it makes combat go faster it makes players more engaged I think it also makes more sense in the, like, tactical sense. Because, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, there are support classes, but support ends up being more of, like, all right, what can I do beforehand? Or, yeah, what can I do at, at reaction once the round? Mm-hmm. Um, so now it can be... It, it, it also, things that make sense to do in real life, like, okay, um, we're going to run together. We want to travel together <laughs> down this. In D&D terms, it's like, okay, you have to run... And then the other person on their turn will run, or you could hold an action to death. It's just now it's like, okay, we're both going to move over here. That's easy enough to do. I like that. I I agree. It simplifies things a lot. Uh, You do have to like finagle the rules a little bit with like until end of turn effects, until end of your next turn effects, uh, or until the beginning of your next turn and just make it the beginning of the player's turn Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Uh, so some spells and some abilities might have more or less power because of that. Uh, but that's uh, that's a sacrifice that I'm willing to make 100% for that. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on. Andrew Kaufman uh, asked for pointers for a first-time DM. Well, we can, well, let's say one each. One each. One each. Um, Do you have some? Sure. Uh, let's d- listen to your players. Mm-hmm. Um, if they are really liking something, then you should then feed into that. If they're really not liking something, be you have to be okay to be like, all right, I, you, you know what, that wasn't the thing. We'll go ahead and like a, if you try to implement a new mechanic or you you're on a storyline that they're just not enjoying, be like, okay, here's the out. Here's what we'll drop. Let's make this fun. Mm-hmm. That yes, I, th- to play off of that is just it really is the idea of being flexible to what your players want because ultimately it is not your game. It is our game. It is everybody's game. It's a collaborative effort. Um, a lot of a lot of groups have tension where some players are happy, or the DM is happy, and the player and some players aren't, or the players aren't. Mm-hmm. And it's like, ooh, let's go. As an example, ooh, let's go to Waterdeep and let's start our Acquisitions Incorporated franchise and start doing stuff around the town. And it's like we're trying to hunt dragons right now. We were planning on passing through Waterdeep. Let us leave. Yeah. We kind of stopped the thing we were interested in, and now we're implementing some fun mechanics that the DM wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And we've been stuck there for a while. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Ricardo asks, says, I don't enjoy playing Storm. Do you feel this way? How do you feel about Storm as a mechanic in, I assume, MTG? Because there's not a Storm mechanic in D&D. Well... The storm scale, as it is known, Mm -hmm. is the scale of likelihood for a feature to return in a Magic the Gathering set, named because storm is very rare to return in Magic the Gathering products. It's hard to play around, or it's a hard design around. It's hard to design around, for sure. Uh, It's not the highest thing on the storm scale. Ironically, yeah. I love storm. Yeah. I think it's very fun, uh, particularly at instant speed, when you can fuck around and it's like you have a, a massive stack of effects of people like countering things or removing things. And it's just one person's turn. Everyone's doing a bunch of stuff at instant speed and then grape shotting on top of that. Yeah. Or whatever and just getting great value out of it. Um, the problem is, is that the base card effects need to be low. Yeah. You know, grape shot deals one damage to a target. Like you can't you can't do something like an end the festivity style effect where it's one damage to everything right. and then storm it because then suddenly everything's taking twelve damage. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you just you just need to be careful with the card effects. Like a two mana draw a card, discard a card with storm. I think that would be perfectly reasonable. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the storm based cards because of that are kind of low power. So it's really just the same several storm cards that come up over and over again as being quote unquote the problem. Mm -hmm. The mechanic itself, I don't think is that bad. Fair. Uh, let's see. Um, Young Hot Pockets asks, how do you feel about rulings that do not have specific rules written to them? Example, specific actions with no written rules to declare what to roll, how much damage to do. Well, I think that that's what tabletop RPGs are. Yeah. Um, the rule they can only create so many rules for so many things. They're uh, you know, it's one of those things where back in the day if you if you called up uh, Gary Gygax and you're like, How how do you do this? And he goes, Well, how'd you do it in the game? Okay, that's how you do it. Yeah. And you, I think that's another good piece of advice for Dungeon Masters is if you don't know, try to make a fair ruling. If no one liked the ruling, all right, next time we'll do it differently. Yeah. It's it, it's as simple as that. Like you don't you don't really need to sweat the small stuff. I think that's a really good piece of DM advice. Don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, Dante asks, "What is the best TTRPG system that is not Five E and why?" Best obviously is a very um, that's very subjective. Very subjective. So a couple that I've played include um, Monster of the Week. I'm currently running a Monster of the Week game for some friends. Um, that's very different than 5e mm -hmm. but it's also very different than kids on bikes which is also very different from quest um, or pathfinder or pathfinder or, or starfinder or the or upcoming mt uh, mcdm yeah uh so or cinder hearts it's really what you want to do if you want to play like a more like a more story immersive just being guys being guys or whatever um like a, a kids on bikes is great because then there you're just normal people dealing with dealing with a weird monster or if you want to be more powerful but have more open-endedness to it then monster of the week is actually really great because here's the idea behind the mechanic good luck <laughs> or vampire the masquerade vampire the masquerade or we could go on and on and on and on and on forever uh dagger heart gonna be coming out dagger heart um but it's call of cthulhu <laughs> like we could just ramble on about all the systems. I think if you're wanting as close to a D and D experience as possible without playing five E, then you probably should just play Pathfinder. Pathfinder is a good option. Um, it really just comes down to what do you want to play? Mm -hmm. Do you want to play a horror movie where you're probably not going to survive? Then play Call of Cthulhu or dread or dread. Oh, dread. That's a good one. That was a good call. Um, do you want to play in middle earth and you want to do Lord of the Rings? Do the One Ring RPG, yeah, which then got a five E skin that's different than the original One Ring RPG. Um, you want to play Fallout? There's a Fallout RPG. Yeah, there's a there's an RPG for a lot of properties like that. Do you want Do you want to do your CW vampires and werewolves and oh my gosh, then you could do something like Vampire the Masquerade or Cinder Hearts. Cinder Hearts, yeah. Um, there's a million different. RPG systems. You want to be a hamburger? Do the Wendy's RPGs. <laughs> that's a that's a funny joke because that actually exists and it got canceled because people don't like Wendy's. It's a whole thing. It was a, it was a dumb thing, is what it was in my estimation. But all right, um, Will CB ask: Is there going to be a less power creep? Is there going to be less power creep in future Magic sets? No. <laughs> that's the thing, right? Like. Obviously, it's called creep because you don't see it happening necessarily at the time. But also, they, you know, it's a 30 year old game. You look, you, plenty of people make memes about it. It's like 30 years ago. All right, I pay one and I play a 2 1. So, Ooh. Ooh. 2 1 vanilla creature. Now it's like, I pay one. Uh, this is a 1 1, but every time you cast a spell, you cast your first non creature spell a turn, I get to draw a card unless you pay equal to its uh, yeah. power. That's Esper Sentinel. Or uh, you pay one and you have a 2-1 that uh, you create a number of treasure tokens equal to the amount of artifacts that your opponents have, mm -hmm. uh, which is so format changing and warping that it's basically banned everywhere. But yeah, so it's like, yeah, sure, there are big examples of, of like that. But at the same time, they Wizards of the Coast wants to give you a reason to buy the new cards. 
And if the new cards are just the same cards or just boring cards or have no point, you're not going to buy them. Mm-hmm. You know what the last vanilla creature that they made was? What was it? Yargle and Multani. Yeah. They don't make vanilla creatures anymore. Yes, technically, you can you go to the you go to the Lord of the Rings starter decks. They have vanilla creatures in them. Two vanilla creatures. I'm pretty sure they're just reprints or reskins of previous creatures. I I don't care. The big one that everyone knows about is Yargle and Montani. And that one is and even because that's it's a, a f- super popular card. <laughs> because it's a fucking 18-6. Yeah. <laughs> a vanilla 18-6 can do a lot of crazy shit. Especially you know, out of the command zone. <laughs> you know what sucks is for Multani is Multani is an act, you know, another card that has an actual ability. Like it's a and more or less they just said, okay, Yargle and Multani. Yarg what if we took Yargle and added Yargle? We can't just do that. There's not there's only one Yargle. Okay, we'll ta- we'll graft Multani onto Yargle and now he's a double Yargle. Sure. <laughs> Okay. Because the Argyle's a 9-3. It's, ugh, man. I think Multani's whole thing is that he was, like, doubling stuff. So it like, kind of makes sense. All right. Um, who am I? Let's, let's see. Um, Sefa asks, I play Commander. What do you think about infinite combos? I'm looking for some feedback. Depends on the nature of the infinite combo. And depends on you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you start with that, and we'll go. Then we'll go nine decks. Well, if you're playing Cedh, everything's an infinite combo. That's how you win the game. Mm-hmm. If you are playing not Cedh, are you doing win the game infinite combos like Thoracle? Uh or are you doing all right? This generates me a million mana, and then I cast everything that I have. Mm-hmm. That's a little different. Um. I think it's one of those things that you need to talk to the group like, hey, in our group, we usually don't have infinite combos. There is exceptions for like, okay, this is an infinite combo if I have six things on the field and 17 mana to go. Yeah. But that's one thing. But yeah, we don't, uh, in, in our main play group, we'd usually stick away from, stay away from like two card infinite combos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that that's just a rule zero discussion that you have with your players. It's like, all right, I've got, don't bring... The only de- don't only bring a deck that wins via infinite combos. <laughs> Maybe bring some other decks too, and then so, play what works. There's nothing wrong with infinite combos. There's just just gotta make sure you're on the same page as everybody because it can feel bad to be infinitely comboed out when you're like, all right, turn four, I finally play my command. Okay. Hmm. Turn four, I play my commander, and the game's over already. Okay. That's um, Cedh. CDH goes to turn five. Something has gone horrifically wrong. Tomio asks, what do you guys think about the artificer archetype from the previous year? In terms of d and I assume so. I'm I would assume sure. as well. Um, I'm, we're going to go from the D&D perspective. The artificer was a weird... For me, it was always a weird class. Mm-hmm. Uh, in like all of its iterations. And it's in a fine spot. I think it's just a little bit too complicated for its own good. Yeah. It it exists, and its problems are the same reasons that the mystic doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, I think it's powerful. I think it's weird to tie a class to magic items. Yeah. And that's kind of my biggest holdup. Yeah. I, I once looked at building an artificer. Um, just, I There's so many choices to make. And none of your choices feel, it feels very hard to go a single build path. Like, uh, you know, obviously when you're going with like Warlock, Mm -hmm. Warlock has some very dedicated choices you can make to be like, oh, I'm going to be an upfront fighter Warlock, or I'm going to be the backline caster Warlock, or I'm going to be the ritual Warlock. Whereas opposed to the Artificer, it's like, okay, I can choose this thing. I'll be really okay at, at, at combat, but then... Uh, if I, I could also make a bag of holding for my group, I guess, uh, yeah. or, or I could give somebody plus one once a day, but that's probably going to be me. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of choices, but they're so vague. And I think some people can obviously really thrive with that. I cannot. Mm. What I say, uh, convince your friend to be an artificer so that you can get the magic item. Yeah. All right. I think that's a good spot. I think that's a good spot or you that's got something else? That's a good else? spot. No, I'm fine. All right. I think we got to, I got to get back to work. 
I want uh, I want to just wrap up this podcast and get it ready to post so I don't have to think about it anymore. Because we got a, we got another we got another podcast to do. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we've, if you made it this far. I apologize. I apologize. Next week we have a bonus episode of the podcast yes. coming out. We're interviewing our good friend Randy Sackett, the Forged Realm on TikTok. We're going to talk about some Gen Con shenanigans, 3D printing, burnout as a DM and as a content creator, a whole lot of really good stuff. We're going to have that bonus podcast up for you next Wednesday. So you're going to get, multi- for the next couple of weeks, you're going to get several podcasts yeah. every single, you're going to get podcasts every week for a little while. Uh, because tomorrow, tomorrow, when the podcast goes live, we'll be interviewing, uh, we'll be, ooh, do we want to talk about it? Nah, yeah, fuck it. We're going to be interviewing uh, Ivy, who is a TikToker and a, a content creator who created uh, the Crit Wards, the Creators in Tabletop RPG Awards mm-hmm. that premiered at last Gen Con. So we're going to be talking about the awards show and how that's going and how year two of the Crit Awards is going to be going, which is pretty cool. Of course, you can get the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast every other week. Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m., Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, the YouTube channel, all of that nonsense. Sam, do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap it on up? I'm hungry. You're hungry? Lunchtime. Mm. And work. Then we'll end this episode of the podcast as we end all of our game nights. And let's yargle this, Multani. 